I'm about to introduce Sam Forbes, who I hope can hear me, because Sam Forbes is not with us today. He's going to be talking to you a lot about remotely operated vehicles at Australia's largest oil and gas development. Remotely. And he's going to be doing it remotely, I hope. Sam, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. We can hear you. Thank you. I am now relieved. Off you go. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. No. Thank you. Um, I, I guess it's a little ironic uh, speaking to you all from, from down here in Australia when I work for, work for a company called Fugro and they're, and they're Dutch headquartered. Um, so, you know, you, you're all closer to, to our, our head office than I am right now. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we've got some, some interesting stories to tell you and an interesting um, kind of demonstration of a, of a live remote operations centre. Um, you are going to hear me talking to, to Kim, who's going to help me on, on your side and, and click through the, through the slides. So it's going to be a little bit old school, um, but hopefully it's, uh, you know, hopefully it's clean enough and you can get a good enough picture. Uh, if we go through to the, the second slide, uh, Kim. So just briefly, I guess, before we, before we move into the next phase, um, uh, who are Fugro? Uh, Fugro, like I said, based in the Netherlands, um, but have extensive, extensive reach across the globe. They've been in Australia and Western Australia now for over 50 years. We're present in over 65 countries and have over 10,000 employees. Commonly, uh, Fugro are viewed as an oil and gas service provider, but the reality is that they... They go far beyond that. They cover both land and sea. We even do a lot of airborne work. And these days we're moving heavily into renewable energy, supporting the um, wind, wind renewables and, and, and the likes of that. So Fugro, Fugro cover, cover a plethora of activities. But in the context of the Australian business, it, we do predominantly focus on the oil and gas sector and, and the offshore sector. While we do support a lot of the land services around power lines and rail, a lot of what you hear down here is, is, is oriented towards the, the oil, and oil and gas support at this stage. But we will talk about some of the interesting and exciting opportunities in, in other sectors. So if we can just go to slide three, please, Kim. So... Fugro Next and, and Remote Operations, which I guess is what we're, we're likely to hear about, is, is something that was born in about 2015. Uh, the, the landscape in the oil and gas environment was changing, the oil and gas price had plummeted, and particularly in Australia at that time, we were starting to question what the way forward was, was for the business. We're highly leveraged, we had really expensive assets and the path out looked long and, and we, were, we questioned whether or not we were going to survive that journey. So we were looking at ways to, to really overhaul our business. We, we, we ran as fast as we could initially looking for different opportunities to change the way we work. We went down the path of speaking to the military, looking at autonomous vessels, but quickly learned that that probably wasn't the best solution for us at, at that point in time. While we definitely believe full autonomy is is going to happen in the in the not too distant future. We had to had to find the middle step, and, and that was what well, we we believe the opportunity was to start to change the form factor of the vessels that we were working on, not entirely down manning them, but to do that we had to bring a series of technologies into play to allow us to relocate our people from our vessels to to a central location. And I mean, that, that's, it's not, a, not really a new paradigm. I guess the interesting challenge that we have working in the offshore oil and gas sector is that we're working in a dynamic environment. We're on a boat, it's not in a fixed position. We don't have any uh, fiber optic connectivity. So we do, have, we do have a satellite link and have always had a satellite link, except it's been relatively poor. We've always been dealing with kilobytes. Um, through this journey, we managed to open that link up initially to about five megabytes, and now we can get up to around 15 for, for a single vessel for a project. Again, it doesn't sound like a lot of, um, a lot of data, and it's not, but that's where this journey has got, has got interesting. And on the back of opening up that link, and, and we're still leading the way there, there's not a lot of people who even managed to get 15 megabits of um, data on an offshore platform. We've been able to build out a series of uh, a technology stack which allows us to bring a lot of data, HD video, back through that really skinny pipe. And additionally, audio and, and a lot of those other things. Um, so, so I guess I'll, I'll pause there and, and, and start to move through kind of, you know, what is remote operations and, and, and what it is we're looking at. So if we can go through to the next slide, um, 
Kim, and then click through that again. We're going to move through the next couple uh, reasonably quickly. I, I think, you know, it, it's an interesting um, paradigm where, you know, we we come from cons a conservative industry in oil and gas. And if we if we look back to, to 1969 and the moon, and I guess if we flick through that next slide as well, um, remote operations aren't new. These things have been, you know, remote operations have been executed for, for over 50 years now using satellite communication. It's just been the other technology that sits around it that's allowed us to execute such tasks in, in an oil and gas environment. So if we now go to the next slide and fast forward 50 years and through to the next one, this is, um, so what, what you're seeing right here is our first example of a remote operations room in Perth, Western Australia. This was on the 15th floor of one of the major CBD buildings, and it's, it's not a very conducive environment to, a, to, an offshore, um, to an offshore kind of control centre. But when we stood this up and we started demonstrating this capability to our clients and, and to our peers, no one really believed that we were able to execute robotic command and control and bring data feeds from a vessel which is, say, 2,000 kilometres away while still a few hundred kilometres offshore with a robotic system up to 4,000 metres under the water. We had to take them into this room so they could really see it to believe it. And once they, once they could see that we had guys centrally located in a Perth-based facility operating robotics at such an extreme distance in such an extreme location, everyone's eyes started to widen about around the, the possibility of, of what it is we could achieve going forward. So we go through to the to the next slide. I guess this just gives you a, a simple breakdown of, of what our operations look like. If you look to, to the far left of your screen, you've got a robotic system, subsea. Just above that, you've got a vessel. That was the extent of the operation historically. Typically, you would have have had all of our operations teams, all of our robotic um, operators, all of our data analysts, all situated atop that vessel, executing all that work. And I guess the, the interesting thing or the important thing to note is that working on that platform is inherently risky, so you have all of the, all of the safety issues that, that go along with it. Through, through, the, through creating this series of technology, we've been able to introduce just the, other, the other three images is the satellite communication piece linked to the ground station where we currently operate and to the control room that I'm, that, well, one of the rooms that I'm standing, standing in right now. If we click through to the, through to the next slide, this is, a, uh, this is a video we actually took recently and it's not a... Um, it's not a complex task by any means in the in the subsea world, but it was a it was a live demonstration to one of our clients to show them that it was possible to to execute a routine task in the offshore subsea environment from the remote operations centre. So that was one of the um, ROV pilots sitting in the chair just behind me, controlling that robotic system and the robotic arm from thousands of kilometres away, connecting a crane hook to a subsea basket. And it's, you know, it, it really has to be seen to be believed, and there's a lot of people that still question our ability to do it until they actually watch it watch it happen. If we go through to the, the next slide. So what you're looking at here is the Nangara um, ground station or the Perth um, International Telecommunications Centre, and our remote operations centre is located within that uh, satellite precinct. And that's largely to do with contingencies, um, power management, and the desire to minimise latency over satellite communications as much as as much as possible. Uh, if we flick through to the to the next slide, this is kind of um, the, the the future state for us. You know, we, we the, the journey to get to this point to control a subsea ROV system from a central location was largely. Um, focused on the back of one of our clients. So, so one of our major clients is Woodside. They, they're a West, an Australian-owned oil and gas producer and one of the largest producers in, in the country. We work closely with them through this process. They enabled us to, to test technology on their field. We, we did all the development work in-house, but they enabled us to test it and prove it out um, very rapidly. Now that we're in a position where we're working day-to-day -day on a 
on a Woodside Fields from this central location, we're now looking to what those next steps are. And what we're, what we're doing is we're taking all of that technology and we're packaging it into a very small form factor. So if you look at that slide right now, the, the second image down, you can kind of see a, a container with a small satellite dome on top of it. That has all of the technology that enables this operation packaged into a small form factor. And the really exciting thing is that and now allows us to put that technology into any location. So we no longer have to be working from solely a Fugro platform. We can be working from a third-party vessel. We can be working from a shore-based location. And as I get to, we can start to look to work in locations beyond um, the oil and gas sector. It's worth probably considering, uh, noting at this point that um, we, we started on this journey to really optimise and, and change the way we did work to, to improve our cost base. But there's been a whole bunch of knock-on effects that have been extremely significant. There's the, uh, the, the the social factors, for example, and the impact on our workforce. Bringing people back to a central location has, has enabled people to be closer to their families and change that dynamic of working in the oil and gas environment. Then we, then we shift to, you know, to the environmental factors. And as we start to downsize the assets, the volume of diesel that we're burning is significantly reduced. And we only see those positive impacts increasing over time as, as we proliferate this, in, this entire strategy. And then we get to, to the opportunity of opening up all the other activities that we can execute on the back of this platform. So we go to the next slide. We're just gonna quickly give you a walk around this, this room. I'm just gonna turn this down a bit so it doesn't run back through. Um, so what we're looking at here is one of the rooms within our remote operations centre. Unfortunately, as is the case with any live, uh, live cross, you're likely to have issues and you're seeing flashing blue screens. They should have been video feeds from a subsea operation, but unfortunately, the guys offshore have just turned the video feeds off so we can't send you, send you images of fish or otherwise. But like I said, so, so in, in full operation, you would be see, seeing four video feeds coming through on a sub seven megabit link. In addition to that, you'll also be seeing, for example, sonar data in the top left and right of the screen of, of the room, you'll be seeing vessel positioning data and then all of the metadata associated with that operation. On top of that, again, all on that seven meg link, you will have all of the control data associated with the robotic systems. And that's one of, I guess, the, the, key, the key kind of um, pieces that, that has made this work is our ability to bring all that data through such a, such a, a slim pipe. Um, I think one of the things that we learned early in the piece, or we're, we're told um, by the military and some of our end clients, was that as we move through this journey, one of the things that we really need to consider are the human factors. You're still going to have people working in a remote location, you need to ensure that the relationship between the guys in the central location and the guys offshore is strong and they're able to work together. We tested um, different platforms, you know, the, the typical communications platforms that we all see, but they weren't necessarily robust enough. They weren't giving us the, the feel that we would like. So we ended up building out our own communications platform on the back of satellite communications. And that allows us to manipulate data, audio, video, and all in the, all in the uh, form of an iPad. So I'll just quickly show you here. So what you're looking at is one of the iPads that, that, our, that our operators would typically look at on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can see all of the locations that are enabled for data um, and audio. It's as simple as um, you know, the touch of a finger, the guys can pick pick a location up, drag it and drop it to the next location and it will automatically connect over, over that satellite link. And that's for data, video, and then all of the feeds that you were seeing on the screens, they're all coming through on the back of that connection. We really tried to simplify as much as we possibly could the ability for the guys to connect between, between the locations. And, and I think the really important thing there is the feedback that we've got is that the guys offshore wouldn't know that the teams in Perth aren't working aboard the vessel. Um, some of the other things that are, are, are worth looking at is, is giving the ability to the guys in this room to control the outcome. So you look at a screen like this and, and what, it, what it gives them is the ability to relocate video, video switch. 
but beyond that, it actually gives them power and control over the communications link. We have scenarios where our data feeds are very, very important, while the robotic control feeds can be less so. So you give the guys the ability to control latency and control bandwidth on the fly. And I'll, and I'll get to this point shortly, but it's those two features that started to get people like the Australian Space Agency looking into, into what it is we were doing. Um, so transitioning from the, the human factors piece, we then get to, to the control piece. So, so what you're looking at over here is a typical ROV control console from an offshore operating um, platform. We've relocated the exact same control architecture that you would see on a boat to this location so that it's familiar to the guys on the ground. We have a next generation control console that we're working through at the moment, which will sit atop of the, ag the agnostic platform and, and, and work in touch screens and all of the unique AV type scenarios that, um, that I'm sure everyone's talking about on the ground over there for, for the next couple of days. Uh, just quickly, I'll give you an example of one of the, um, one of the tools that we've had to develop. Um, we, when, with working in the scenario of the satellite communications, you've obviously got a physical limit. Um, and, and that physical limit induces about a half a second lag from the for the data from the site to, to this location, which induces some issues around robotic control. So we've had to build out some unique tools to allow the guys to still continue to execute their work. And one of those tools is an augmented reality piece on top of a simulator, which allows the team to look at um, the location of their robotic arm in the, um, on the front of the underwater robot. So typically, you would look at the guys offshore would use a robotic manipula uh, master manipulator like this to control the subsea robotic arm. What we've done is we've built out a simulator with an augmented reality piece overlaid on top of it so that the guys can watch the video feeds and the simulation and the augmented reality all at once and see the discrepancy between the two, between the two images. So if you look at this, I've just turned on the augmented reality piece. Unfortunately, I'm not controlling the robotic arm at the moment, so it's in, a, in, it's in a stationary position. But if I was controlling it, you'd see it tracking the augmented reality with a slight delay. And this allows um, the guys to understand that, that discrepancy and allows them to execute um, you know, minor, uh, minute tasks and, and often challenging tasks like you saw with the crane hookup on the earlier, on the earlier video. Um, so that's, I guess, a, a really brief overview of, um, of, of one of our rooms within the Remote Operations Centre. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's worth switching back to, to the slide deck. I've got two slides remaining um, before a couple of questions. But I think one of the exciting things is the, uh, is the opportunities beyond oil and gas. We didn't set out to, to, to solve this problem. We really set out to solve a problem in the oil and gas sector in the offshore environment. But through the necessity to move fast um, and, and to get technology on the ground, we built an agnostic platform that allows us to uh, that allows us to integrate any robotic system on the back. Of it. So we actually don't care whether or not it's a, a truck, a drone, a terrestrial robot. It's easily integrated into the system that we've got, and as we bring on that new uh, that new control desk and whatnot, it means that we can start changing out the control architecture relatively easily, and then we can start bringing in pieces like um, virtual reality and start overlaying them through this architecture on top of any any robotic system. And that's, I guess, where we're really getting excited. There's there's some uh, opportunities in mining. There's some opportunities in in defence that are you know really be able to leverage this capability and then there's also some opportunity in space and it's you know it's interesting that you know the space industry in Australia has been has been the one that has kind of latched on to us um, I guess most recently looking at our ability to work in latency affected environments and saying well what's the difference between what you do in an offshore subsea operating environment to working in orbit or, or working on the moon and that takes us to, to my final slide um, you know, this is just an example of, of one of the opportunities that we're seeing out there, and I'm sure there's plenty of this across the globe. The Australian Space Agency have kind of put the shout out and said, look, we want to build a robotic command and control facility in Australia 
focused on the space industry. We want to take all of the learnings from remote operations and remote operations centres past in Australia and, and across the globe, build one here to focus on space. So we're looking at that and we see that as a, a very exciting opportunity and, and, and an interesting way to take some technology from typically conservative industries and take it into kind of a, a future, future forward um, industry. So that's all I've got for you. I'm just going to turn the volume back up and I'm hoping that I wasn't talking to myself. Um, and if you do have any questions, then, um, then go for it. Sam, uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, can you hear us all right? I can't hear you. Okay. You, you, came across, you, you know, can't hear the rest of them because they haven't applauded yet. Just hang on. A round of applause yeah, for Sam. Sam, thanks very much. A really, a really great start to uh, the Control Room Summit. You can, you can hold that honorary title of the first presentation to the first ever Control Room Summit. Uh, we're yeah, we're very, very pleased. I'm to myself. <laughs> no, you're absolutely not. We've got a room full of very excited people who've got lots of questions that they want to ask, and I can probably take one or two. So who wants to ask Sam something about remote operations? Sam, you know this is the bit where they all say, no, I don't want to be the first one to ask the first question at the first <laughs> inaugural control room summit. You, who, who said that? There's a man at the back. Hang on, Sam. I've got to go all the way to the back of the room with the remote microphone, which I hope is working, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> okay. I'm assured it's on. Try it. Hey, Sam. Uh, Ryan Jay from uh, Matrix. I have one question. You, you touched base on uh, controlling latency and uh, on the fly. Can you just elaborate yeah. a little more on that? Yes, yeah, so that's um, one of the interesting things that we've had to develop. So obviously we can't push beyond physical limit, but we can go the other way. So we, we bring the data in generally in a single packet, but we do have the ability to split it and split the feeds between the different operators. So for example, we have teams of inspection personnel looking at data to find anomalies and to compile it for our clients. And this is one of the primary deliverables from a big portion of the work we do. But equally, we've got a, a team of robotic operators who don't necessarily care about the quality of the data as long as they can see what's going on. So, so what we do is we give the guys on the ground the ability to take the latency from, say, half a second up to one, two, three, four, and commonly the inspection team will operate at about four seconds while the robotic team are operating at about half a second. On top of that, we also give them the ability to manipulate the bandwidth on the fly. So we'll set them a, a, an upper limit, um, say 15 megabits for an operation, but we'll set the target at say 10 megabits. Obviously we're getting charged for, for data. So we set the upper limit at say 10, but if the guys need to open that up, if they've got um, shadowing from the vessel, rain or whatnot, it gives them the ability to use those two tools to ensure the quality of the, the data that's coming through. So they can open that pipe up from 10 to 11 or 12 meg at the same time as pushing that latency out to four seconds, say. And that was the, that was the reason that the space agency triggered because the reality is we can actually induce that latency for our robotic operators as well. So we could push that out to eight seconds and suddenly we're operating on the moon. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, any other questions? I can take one more question for Sam. I'm looking around the room. All right. So how, how difficult was it to sell this concept to your first customer? Um, difficult until they needed it. Um, it was a case of, you know, remote operations are, are not new in Australia. Most of the cent, um, head offices are thousands of kilometres away from the mining and oil and gas sites. And it's Typically, an, an, issue, an issue occurs in an offshore operating environment. You have to get people on a plane, parts on a plane, send them even... Say, say we, for example, we could be bringing guys in from Norway, then flying them to, to the middle of Australia, then putting them on a chopper, getting them out to a field to solve a problem. Every minute, every hour, every day is an extremely expensive cost in an offshore environment. We managed to, to overcome, say, a three- or four-day issue in about eight hours. Um... So half a day, we got the call in the morning, we brought a team in, we solved the problem, our clients walked away and went, okay, we get it. And that was really the, the tipping point for them, which, which it, you know, not, not necessarily everyone had bought in at that point, but what it did was open the door for us to start pushing the idea further into their, into their way of operating. Okay, Sam, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Forbes again from uh, Fucro.
It's a great pleasure having you on board, uh, and I'm going to cut our losses before, before we lose you somehow, some way. That, that worked really, really well. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. No, thank you. Enjoy. Okay. Cheers. Very good.